Thank you. Um, now we, we turn to uh, Hilary uh, Apple, who's, uh, who's already published memos on um, Putin's renationalization campaign, fighting corruption or forcing officials' loyalty. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to especially extend my appreciation to the organizers of today's uh, events because it's certainly an extraordinary public good to our profession to bring all of us together from around the world, scholars and policymakers alike. So I, I very sincerely appreciate the hard work of the Ponars people. Thank you. As was said, the title of the memo, co authored with my former student Wendy Shang, is an uh, Putin's renationalization campaign, fighting corruption, or forcing officials' loyalty? Question mark. The memo has three parts, which I'll present today. Essentially, it explores the motivations behind the renationalization campaign that began during Putin's third term. The first part is, you know, when did this start? What prompted this campaign? The second part is, what does it entail? And third, why did it come into being? And to foreshadow the answer to this, certainly it has multi-purpose uh, to it. It can be thought of as an anti-corruption campaign and other uh, purposes as well that I'll mention, but to, to foreshadow our contribution is that we feel this is a very important campaign for consolidating power and ensuring elite loyalty. So let me talk about this repatriation or this renationalization campaign. It came about in response to the Bolotnoi Square protests following the Duma elections in December 2011 as a kind of um, recognition that um, although there were many reasons for these protests, a very successful rallying cry of Alexei Navalny was that the party of power, the party of Putin, united Russia, was the party of swindlers and thieves. And there was some recognition that this would be an effective mobilizing tool for the opposition to note just how much corruption there is perceived among political elites in Russia. And so following the elections uh, in 2012, there were a series of proposals requiring uh, high-level civil servants and political elites to repatriate their, their wealth, their families. Uh, there were restrictions uh, proposed on holding real estate abroad and so on. The initial proposals in 2012 were actually successful in the lower house but stalled in the upper house. And as a result, in order to show, as Regina Smith uh, mentioned, a certain responsiveness to these public protests about corruption, uh, President Putin uh, proposed his own version of the bill in which he uh, limited some of these uh, bans, but he did insist upon the uh, requirement that high-level civil servants could not have foreign bank accounts or own foreign securities. For example, he relaxed the ban on owning foreign real estate with the argument that after all, in the Soviet times, there were Russians who held real estate uh, abroad that they may have some family connection to, and so therefore, as long as they were able to give the source of the, of the funding for the foreign uh, properties, or if they would declare this in their income declaration, then it would all be uh, acceptable. Now, this did, you know, it was expected to pass very quickly given Putin's personal endorsement, and in fact, it became the, um, on civil servants foreign assets law. The, um, the repatriation campaign led some politicians to leave the political arena in response because they were told either you get rid of your foreign bank accounts and foreign assets or um, you would face um, severe penalties after a three month period. And in fact, uh, nine senators immediately resigned, five of whom were on the Forbes most richest uh, Russians list. Um, because they recognized that perhaps the advantages of holding wealth abroad were greater than the advantages that politicians can gain in many respects um, by being part of the State Duma. Uh, another aspect of the repatriation campaign that didn't initially pass was the ban on family members living abroad. This is actually an interesting one because it has not seemed to go away. So it didn't become part of the original bill in 2013, but it came back as a proposal in 2015 and again in 2016 and was recently rejected in the spring of 2017 that children of members of the civil service could uh, live and study abroad with the argument that, the, that this was a, a kind of right that, uh, of education. The ability to... Um, allow uh, children to live abroad was actually quite an interesting one in many respects. Um, but 
it, it has not been uh, an, a scope that's been uh, increased in over the course of time. The same wouldn't be true for the people who are covered by this um, ban. In fact, originally it was supposed to be uh, high-level civil servants, um, board members of the central bank, uh, ministers, uh, regional elites, but in fact it's been expanded over time, even most recently, to include police officers, um, members of the interior ministry, and the directors of state prisons. So, uh, in fact, the, the scope has expanded, even if this is something that started earlier in uh, President Putin's third term. Now, um, why did it come into being? So I've told you, you know, when it started and what it entails. Um, it came into being officially as a response to these calls uh, by large street protests uh, of you know, uh, frustration with corruption at the highest levels, and in particular, in United Russia. And this was part of an anti-corruption campaign that was supposed to be quite visible and um, therefore perceived by the population as a response to those concerns. And I think to some extent it was. There are different numbers that have been uh, available uh, as to how many people have been either fired because they haven't declared their real estate abroad and so on. Sometimes this has been the initiative of the government, and other times it's actually um, the opposition blogger, blogger Alexei Navalny himself who's tried to expose uh, people who have violated those laws. But it's also justified as part of a kind of Russian patriotism, which has been, I think, compatible with much of the rhetoric in the third term. The idea that Russians, uh, Russian leaders should stand with both feet in Russia, the idea that, that their wealth should be kept at home, their children should be kept at home, and exposing someone as having wealth abroad or children abroad has remained a way to question the loyalty, the patriotism of Russian elites, even if it has not been banned outright in the case of family members. Uh, but there's a third justification that we feel motivates this um, policy. And one is that it was a way to shield Russian politicians from pressure abroad. This was part of the patriotism or the nationalism that Russian elites shouldn't be uh, swayed by the ability of foreign governments to, in fact, confiscate, freeze their assets. And this was made explicit in the State of the Union address by um, President Putin in 2012 in supporting this ban. And perhaps his concerns were on the mark, because in the response to the war in Crimea, the Western sanctions explicitly targeted individuals who had close ties to President Putin to try, in principle, to undermine some of their loyalty to the regime. The final motivation that the memo uh, wants to emphasize, however, is that there was either a deliberate or quite a, a valuable uh, side uh, dimension to this program, which is it was a way in which you could consolidate power at a time when there seemed to be slipping of elite loyalty. After all, if you want to challenge the regime and you no longer can hold wealth abroad, your safety net in the West has been pulled out from under you. The possibility of defection in the sense of uh, deciding to break with the regime and move abroad has been undermined if you do not have the ability to keep your assets abroad. And equally important, even if you do choose to keep your assets abroad, perhaps you won't want to attract too much attention from the, the leadership if you know that you are vulnerable to uh, being fired or imprisoned if you're um, continuing to hold that wealth abroad. So it may be just as useful for the regime to know that certain people are not following these, um, these bans on their foreign uh, wealth. So the argument in the, um, in the memo is really trying to think about the political advantages as well as the explicit uh, advantages that are behind the repatriation campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much.